Our focus topics today are first, we were asked a question by one of our viewers, which is, why would anybody want to use a packet uh, or pouch in providing electricity with an electric vehicle? So the first part of our show today will focus on an exclusive introduction of the LG battery pack. LG's battery is now the dominant uh, opposing uh, battery solution versus Tesla in the marketplace. And we basically have a video of theirs that they provide explaining how this works. After the completion of their video, we'll then come back and sort of critique what we've seen on, on this. In particular, what I wanted to have you keep an eye out for is their thermal management system and whether and how it might work long term. We'll then come back um, for review of their, uh, their, their product and then move on from there to take a quick look at the Tesla battery pack and the process, which I think uh, we all know better than the packet solutions offered by uh, places like LG. We'll then uh, follow that on with a discussion of what I call um, RIP uh, BMW M3. Uh, the reasons why the M3 is a terrific car, but uh, it, it's, it's about to get sort of destroyed by the, uh, the, the introduction of the Tesla Model 3. This is Greg for Tesla Fan Insight. Thanks once again for joining us. If this is your first time on our channel, please take time to like and subscribe. If you're a repeat visitor, welcome back. Uh, because today we're using video that doesn't belong to us, we will avoid any copyright strikes by simply showing you video and analysis and calling it a day. Lithium ion polymer battery by LG Chem. Which type of battery would be best for EV? The existing nickel battery has short life and low power, resulting in large quantity of battery cells taking up too much space. Also, the heavy battery pack causes more fuel consumption. LG Chem spent lots of time to find a solution to increase battery power, reduce size, and improve durability for an optimal sized battery. Going through many failures and trials in product development, LG Chem has successfully commercialized a very slim, wider, and more powerful lithium ion polymer battery, which is best fit for EV. Since it can be packaged with a pouch made with light and low conductive material without hard metal cases, pouch type battery can have larger space <coughs> than pan type battery, making it easier to manage heat and maximize energy efficiency. This slim and light polymer pouch with stacking and folding method is the most innovative technology that can be applied for tablet PC and mobile phone. Winding type is more likely to be twisted over time and have a higher chance to explode because of heat and pressure. But polymer type uses stacking and folding method, which distributes heat and pressure uniformly throughout the cell. In addition, pouch type cells are stacked in single directions enabling cells to be built in various sizes and widely applicable. LG Chem maximizes safety through patented technology called Safety Reinforced Separator, or SRS, in which every layer of cells are coated with thin nanoceramic, which prevents internal short. Even at high temperature, cells are resistant to deformation. Welcome back. So you've had a chance now to get a feel for LG. 
I thought it was interesting. You know, there are a few interesting aspects of their presentation that came to mind. The first is they really wanted to emphasize the fact that they're the largest provider of EV batteries in the world. And I'm surprised by this because uh, usually you let the marketplace say that you're the biggest and the best, not you. And in this case, I would say that the, there are a couple issues with this. Until Tesla started producing, if you will, 100,000 vehicles and selling them every six months, the actual winner in the space has been BYD because they were selling 10,000 uh, EVs a month in, uh, in China. So very interesting uh, decision on the part of these folks. I really enjoy our running footage, so I'm going to uh, ask it to keep, keep running. And so the first issue is that uh, these folks are really um, emphasizing the fact that they're the biggest and the best. Number one. Number two, they're highlighting who all their customers are. Um, clearly, uh, they have batteries to sell and they have a lot of folks willing to purchase it. I thought it was strange in the discussion for them to include uh, non-EV solutions. And the reason for this is that there's been a stair-step process that's been going on. It was thought that the Korean battery manufacturers had a huge advantage over everyone because they've been manufacturing those batteries for so long. The issue though is that when you're dealing with cell phones or with laptops, the issue of um, high-speed electricity in and out is not there. So overheating challenges is really not something that was an emphasis point until we have started getting to automobiles. So with that being the case, there is an open question in sort of the whole pouch solution, which is how good are those pouches in managing the heat associated with, uh, with uh, production of, of EVs? So the answer is, we don't know, nobody knows. And so I think this is really a fascinating situation because uh, everyone's gonna find out how well this performs. It has not gotten the job, job done to date, but uh, Daimler-Benz, Volvo, Jaguar, as you can see, GM, all these different companies have decided to make this their solution. And I kind of feel like they don't actually have a choice because they're the only company that has the factories available that can provide a solution so that cars can be produced and sold. Two or three years from now, and we're at the end of 2018 right now, in theory, there'll be a lot of providers that uh, manufacturers can choose from. But for now, the answer is there's no choice. So the choice that's available looks like the best one. So to continue, I think that the images provided look terrific. It looks like a terrific battery. It looks like it'll get the job done. The problem is that um, there's a lot of things that work great in the lab and once it's on the road long term, uh, we'll find out if it actually works. The other question mark that's huge here is overnight charging doesn't get it. So the Chevy Volt is a great car, 248 miles, etc. One of the problems though is having both its ability to do supercharging and a network that provides that supercharging means people don't have to do overnight trips all the time in order to get their vehicles um, powered up to run. So there are certain reasons why Tesla has retained its advantage and supercharging is one of those huge ones. And one of the big question marks is how does this technology respond to being supercharged? We'll now switch on to taking a look or discussing sort of what's going on in the case of the Tesla uh, battery pack that we're taking a look at.
So our final look today is at the Tesla battery pack. Uh, as you can see, there's fluid being drained from the pack. It's, a, um, it's actually a Model S battery pack, but the S and the general structure of the S and, and how it's, it, it's handled and the Model 3 is very similar, even though not the same size batteries, etc. This is 18650 batteries produced in Japan by Panasonic under Tesla guidance. Um, you can see the fluid, the cooling fluid that moves uh, between the batteries to help uh, manage temperature, be it hot or cold, to make sure the batteries in their ideal uh, operating range. Um, completely different philosophy than what we've seen from LG uh, with the packets. The advantage of the packets is that you have uh, um, lower cost because you don't have all that metal. In theory, it should weigh less because of the lack of that metal. Um, but the question mark is how well the individual cells manage in terms of their temperature needs in this process. And so there's some unknowns, uh, which Tesla has sort of tried to eliminate with the process that it uses. So the, we'll see how it plays out in the marketplace for now. Uh, Tesla's batteries are running for as long as eight years under warranty uh, successfully. LG's battery solutions have tended to last until warranty in that three-year time frame and then had a huge battery degradation. But we really have to qualify that statement based on the fact that LG is now into uh, pouch 2.0 or perhaps 3.0 for EVs versus that pouch 1.0. And we'll see how this all plays out. So uh, very interesting sort of look in general of what's going on. The next thing that I wanted to sort of dive into here is a discussion of the Model 3. What happened is that there is a uh, viewer of ours who's based in Norway, and he explained that uh, he actually sold his Model S X, and he's now waiting uh, on order for a performance Model 3. And we kind of ran, he kind of ran through uh, key points that were decision-making elements of how and why he did what he did. The first point he made was that uh, he's looking forward to overall performance. So, you know, diesel versus um, electric is wonderful. In the case of Norway, you in essence get free electricity and there are all these other benefits in terms of no tolls or very low tolls is, is the next step. Um, preferred parking, all these different methods encouraging people to get rid of their uh, diesel or uh, gasoline powered engines. The uh, next thing that popped up that he related is the fact that he was looking forward to getting away from his Model X as it ended its warranty run because there are a lot of moving parts there that are going to be very expensive to maintain. In particular, for the Model X, those doors, I think, are going to be a real challenge when not under warranty. And so I've actually heard the statement made by owners of Model S's as well. There have been a huge number of problems associated with the pop-out door handles. And so there are a lot of owners that are looking forward to getting rid of their vehicles uh, once no longer under warranty so that they can move away from that headache. Now let's move on to the Model 3 and the M3. In the case of the Model 3, a lot of people have discussed the fact that there are 17 moving parts, and this is not including the batteries, it's called the battery one part. Um, beyond those 17 moving parts, there are 40 other parts on the car. So yes, you could have some issues, but you can stabilize and repair or replace those parts more easily. And in particular, one part that's critical is what's going on with the door handles and the fact that you don't have those pop-out door handles. They can be frozen in the winter and hard to get to, but it does help with the aerodynamics of the car. Um, and it's a lot less to work with. So the, the put together of Model 3, I really think sets it up to be a very low maintenance vehicle once you get through the initial bugs. This brings up a discussion of what I consider one of my favorite cars over the last 50 to 100 years, and that is the BMW Model 3, or M3. The M3, as you all know, has been around, I think, for about 15 years now. 
and it's the high performance uh, pocket rocket BMW that a lot of folks have enjoyed uh, for a long time. The, the reason why I decided to bring it up and put RIP on it with a question mark in this show is the fact that, um, number one, I uh, had an M3, ended up selling a, my convertible. Um, a gentleman pulled up next to me one day in a brand new V8 M3, mine was a, a V6. And he explained that he loved the performance, but the problem is when you stuff that V8 in, you're still in the 14 miles a gallon zone. And if you're punching it, you're sub 10 miles per gallon uh, on the car. So while he was enjoying his car thoroughly, his worry was, what do I do? You know, the, the cost of fuel is a severe consideration. In the case of the Model 3, you're getting all that M3 performance without all the fuel issues. The second issue that pops up is repairs. If you take care of your Model 3 well, in theory, you'll get between two and 500,000 miles from the car. That's huge because in the case of the Model 3 or the M3, as with other high-end vehicles across the board, be it Cadillac, BMW, Mercedes, it doesn't matter. Once you get outside of warranty, there are a lot of very expensive systems that have to be maintained and repaired over time. And if you're outside of warranty, um, it quickly arrives at a point where um, a $3,000 repair might exceed the value of the car. So the question mark then is, uh, why retain a car that needs one repair item and that repair item represents at or greater than the value of the car? Another example of this that comes to mind is I have a good buddy of mine. When he was told that his, his, uh, his Porsche, um, he actually had a, 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 I'm gonna say the Panorama, it's the four door, um, Porsche, he pointed out that uh, they announced to him that he had to spend $10,000 for a brake job. And that's when he went and traded the car in and got a, got a BMW uh, M5 fairly new. So I just thought it was interesting because the cost of ownership short and long term can affect whether or not you hang on to the vehicle. And because Tesla has so many few moving parts, I believe there are a lot of owners of very high-end vehicles that are gonna be trading in their cars and watching friends and neighbors to find out what a stable uh, Model 3 can handle in terms of maintenance issues, et cetera, over time. I think this will prompt a lot of people to dump their M3s, hence the reason why I decided to put uh, RIP um, uh, M BMW M3. It's sort of the definition of how Performance has been defined for years. For Tesla Fan Insight, don't forget to do your 20 leg lifts per leg with a five pound weight. Don't go to bed within two to four hours of eating. And um, look forward to any and all comments based on sort of a little different format of show how we handle things today. Tschüss, German, au revoir, French, le hydraut, Hebrew, ni hao ma, Chinese, um, uh, Farvel, Dutch, um, adios. And in Jamaica, we say enough respect, walk good. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for joining us.